Well, uh, welcome to our Friday lecture. We're, we're on week 12 or 13. I'm getting my, my weeks mixed up, so forgive me. I say this every week. I, I, I never know what week, week we're on. I should look this up before I start recording. Uh, so Rob is on, uh, on the road or in the air and, and is not able to join us uh, for the lecture this week. And I was going to fly solo, but then I had this genius idea. Um, Maybe I should reach out to an Emmy Award winning actor who is a fellow Bradbury freak and a dear friend to see if uh, he would want to come and, and talk about Bradbury with our American Supernatural class. And to my great delight, uh, the legendary Bill Obers Jr. said yes. Um, those of you who attended the Lon Chaney, uh, the, the, the screening of, of Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera and stayed for the panel afterwards, you're already familiar with Bill. Uh, Bill, like I, I mentioned earlier, is an Emmy award-winning actor. He plays some of the most terrifying characters. He knows how to turn on the creep. Um, and he's, uh, he's a phenomenal talent um, and uh, somebody who passionately works at his craft. And uh, I've seen him do uh, a couple of Bradbury things. In fact, um, I got to make my theatrical debut, and, and as silly as this sounds to Bill, it's going to be on my resume forever that sure. I was uh, I was in a stage play with an Emmy Award winning actor uh, last October when he came to Indianapolis to do his dramatic reading of Ray Bradbury's Pillar of Fire. And I was uh, kind of, you know, I knew that I was joking around when I said, hey, I'm going to be in the play, you know, talking to my wife. And I got to carry... Um, uh, a lifeless corpse on stage and then go sit down in the audience. So when I did that, my wife leaned over and she said, was that it? And I said, yeah. And she started giggling. So if you heard giggling at the opening of the show, Bill, that was entirely my fault. I, I, I had pranked my wife a little bit, but it is on my resume and it will stay there. So thank you for that. Uh, he also does a one-man stage play, Ray Bradbury, Live Forever, where he takes on the persona of Ray Bradbury. And if you've ever heard Bradbury speak, if you've observed his mannerisms, there's all kinds of Bradbury content on YouTube. Uh, Bill has a remarkable way of channeling Bradbury and convincing you that, that he, is, uh, he is right in front of you. Uh, so, Bill, uh, I, I, I'm not even... I haven't come close to doing justice to everything that you've accomplished in your amazing career. You've played so many uh, immensely spooky characters, uh, but you're, you've, you're also one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. And I can't thank you enough for being here today. Thank you for using the word freak in the introduction. Uh, <laughs> I love the word freak. It's fallen out of favor. We use these softer words, but I really am a Bradbury freak and I'm a Bradbury center freak. I'm a big fan of what you do. I respect the hell out of you personally, Jason, for what you're doing. Um, I just, I'm just i honored to call you my friend and thank you for allowing me to be here. I have oh, no qualifications so. <laughs> to be here, but I'm glad to be here. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> I'm calling bullshit right there. No, because uh, you, have, um, you, you have been immersed in Bradbury's work and have been moved by the power of Bradbury's words far longer than I have. Uh, so um, would you uh, would you uh, share your story, how you came to, to know and love Ray Bradbury? Yeah, um, I was about 14 years old and I was a different kid. Um, I, maybe all kids feel that they're different, but I really felt like an alien on the earth. I was different in every way that you could be different in my culture, um, in my body. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I didn't know if there was ever a chance that I would have a place in this world, a place to fit in. And so I used to take uh, long walks, bike rides through the woods, and um, uh, I was often angry when I would walk through the woods. So I would just ride my bike as far down the path as I could get until the woods got kind of thick. And then I just throw the bike down angrily, purposefully angrily. You know how you know what fun it is to like throw down a bike when you're 15 years old and you're like, yeah. I don't care. I don't care if it's supposed to be here. I don't care if anybody steals it. I don't care. You just shout up at the pine trees and they just mutely stare down. So I'm walking through the woods in one of my angry moods and um, looking down, I saw this thing glint with the light of the sun reflecting off of it. And I looked down and it's the cover of a book. It's called S's for Space and it's by Ray Bradbury. And the, the little double day or bantam, whatever it was, paperback had a, a gilded gold cover. And somebody just left it there in the woods. I never heard of Ray Bradbury. I had no idea who he was, although I was a voracious reader. And I looked down and there's this guy <laughs> in glasses and this ridiculously uh, hopeful guy looking up beyond me is that famous, you know, drawing that's on the cover of that series of books and Ray's looking up beyond me up to something up there. And it made me go, what, is, what the hell is he looking at? And who is he? What is this? So I pick it up 
And uh, I open it up. And the first words that I see are, he came out of the earth hating. Hate was his father. Hate was his mother. It was good to walk again. Good to stretch your cramped arms and get up off your back and try to take a deep breath. He tried. He cried out. He couldn't breathe. He was dead. And boy, I was hooked. Absolutely hooked. So that was Pillar of Fire. And, then, and I, I devoured the entire book. And then I said to my mom, get me more of these. So, you know, in those days you went to the drugstore. So she, every Ray Bradbury collection that came out. Um, so I, I had no idea who Ray was as a person or anything about him until much later in life. I only knew that these words spoke to me. They sometimes made me cry. They sometimes made me joyful, but they got to me. And then later on, as I heard him speak, I realized, aha, it's because Ray also, for, for all of the seeming advantages that he had, in the world and as different as he was from me he also felt like a misfit yeah. so i i think that he's an author for misfits sorry it's such a long answer but that's no 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 that's a, a I, I could listen to that story over and over again bill uh, I, I absolutely adore it and i can completely relate to that that sense of being misplaced and um you know wondering who you are and where you fit in the place um you know, uh, uh, with, with my upbringing, you know, I was homeschooled. I was terrified of peers by the time I got to middle school because the only time I interacted with them was Sunday night and Wednesday night when when we went to church. I was much more comfortable talking with adults. And um, it, yeah, it was, um, uh, I, I was not easy. I didn't fit in easily. And Ray didn't either. And, you know, we just read the Halloween tree for the Bradbury Center book club. And the way that he describes this group of friends, the, this group, this group of young boys, and, and the ideal boy Pipkin who has uh, fallen ill, I, 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 it just seems to me like Ray Bradbury is writing about a childhood and a camaraderie that uh, that he longed for as a child but never really experienced. Um, and so I, I think that is uh, absolutely an important co uh, connection. I think if. Uh, I think this comes through in Bradbury's Supernatural Tales quite often. Uh, he, he is fascinated with the other and, and those who are othered and who are misplaced. Uh, so just to get into one of the stories that we actually read, not the Halloween tree, um, uh, but I highly recommend that to everybody. If you want, uh, it, it, you can read it in one sitting. It is a delightful uh, young adult novel. Um, uh, but we read Homecoming. And I, I gave you the copy that I have, the digital copy I have of the original Mademoiselle 1946 with the Charles Adams illustration. Uh, uh, and that homecoming story has so many similarities. There's uh, so much in common with Charles Adams, Adams family cartoons that you would almost think that, uh, that Adams would have been proprietary with it. I uh, said, wait a minute, why, why are you stealing my idea for a weird family? Uh, but he didn't take it that way at all. He recognized the genius of the story and loved it and it did this really remarkable illustration uh, for that book. And uh, the main uh, character, uh, I believe his name is Timothy, right? I am terrible with names. So it, they have not identified the, the name displacement learning disorder yet, but I have it. And when that becomes an available condition, I will be officially diagnosed. But yeah, Timothy's very, very much othered, uh, not just from peers outside of his house, but in his own home is yes. isolated and and different um ironically because he's normal he's like you and me you know we're, we're mortal we're going to die we can't shape shift or uh, do any astral projection or, or things like that and uh, bradbury was he was quite young when he wrote it wasn't he 26 years old 26 Amazing. yeah okay, I, I understand that bradbury started writing when he was 12 and sold his first story at 19. yes Yes, and he wasn't even paid with uh, with money. They they gave him extra editions of the magazine, like extra copies of the magazine, so that he could pass them out and say, "Hey, look, I'm published now." So, so in his supernatural fiction, I just before we did this to refresh myself, I've got a great collection of um, audio speeches that Ray gave, some from the Bradbury Center collection, and he's talking to a group, and he says that after he did the screenplay for Moby Dick, he was offered all of these screenplays to write, and Gene Roddenberry wanted him to write for Star Trek. And he didn't want to do any of that uh, because he said, I explore myself. I will never tire of exploring myself. I'll do it till I die. Huh? And, and so I wonder what at the age of 25, 24, 20, whatever he was when he started this, what about his own Midwestern childhood was calling to him 
in Homecoming uh, because he, he, he says, particularly in this large group of early stories that really made Bradbury's reputation, he's writing about always aspects of himself. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the, uh, the, you know, I've titled the mod, uh, the, this module, Ray Bradbury, the Godfather of the Midwestern Gothic tradition, but he's much bigger than that. And um, I built, Bill, before we started rolling here and recording, you were asking me, what do you mean by Midwestern Gothic? Do we need to have these regional designations? Um, as, as a child of the Midwest, as somebody who, who grew up in the Midwest, I love the fact that Ray Bradbury writes so beautifully and so nostalgically about the Midwest. Because when he's writing Homecoming, when he's writing all of these tales that we've read, he's living in LA. He's a West Coast person now. He's getting connected and plugged in with Hollywood. Um, uh, the fact that he never forgot where he came from and appreciated where he came from is, is something that people here in flyover country uh, who are often overlooked, uh, there's there's a, a, a deep appreciation uh, for that. I was uh, born in the American South, but we, we have Southern Gothic right. uh, literature. And I wonder if it um, if it is needful, necessary is the wrong word, I think. I was thinking, necessary. is it needful to have a Gothic dark side of every culture? Does every culture have one? Was Ray creating something in Homecoming uh, that did not exist? Or was he tapping into something that did exist and amplifying it? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, but biographically speaking, Ray's writing about himself in this story. Um, his dad was athletic, kind of, um, for lack of a better term, a man's man, patriarchal, uh, strong, uh, a deep sense of duty to provide for his family. Uh, Ray's older brother, Skip, was was very athletic, um, and played a lot of sports, and Ray fell very ill as a young child, was kind of a sickly kid, loved to be read to, uh, learned to be, read by reading Buck Rogers and the Sunday comics and, and the Tarzan comic strips that were adapted from the Edgar Rice Burroughs stories. He was bookish. He was not athletic. You know, his, his older brother, Skip, when he got a new baseball mitt, gave his old one to Ray. And a couple of weeks later, he said, well, Ray, where, where's my old glove? And Ray said, oh, you won't believe it, Skip. I traded it for this swell Buck Rogers figurine. It was about this big. And uh, so Skip uh, beat him up <laughs> because like, why would you trade a, a glove? I'm trying to help you become uh, less nerdy and, uh, and uh, help you get into the things that are gonna get you attention and popularity and you trade it for a toy. Um, and and the yeah. story ends with Timothy crying softly, and Ray was famous for crying. He was famous for tearing up yep. all the time. And there's a story that he wrote later in life called I Remember Sasha, and it's about a, a, a man who sees a woman on the street that he was once in love with. He's now with his wife and his family, and um, he starts to cry. And the kids say, oh, why is he crying? And the mother says something like, oh, the, your father cries at the phone book. And, and that was Ray. Uh, John Houston during... Um, Moby Dick or delighted in bullying Ray until he would burst into tears. He loved yeah. to humiliate him and make him cry. And the story ends with Timothy crying. But yet it strikes me that in all of that, even though all of this, all of Ray's stories tie back to him, they're never about him, right? Because as a kid, I didn't know any of the stuff we're talking about, about Ray's childhood, but I knew that this stuff mm -hmm. spoke to me. Yes. How, how, how did he do that? How did he create from something very specific within him, something so universal that it could be a gift to everyone? Oh, well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I, I think by writing about himself, because I, I mean, I would say, um, you know, you, you look at Dandelion Wine, the character's name is Douglas. Ray Bradbury's middle name is, is Douglas. Um, I, I think in some ways he, he's writing a fictionalized version of his past. He's channeling his lived experiences. And because those lived experiences are so real uh, and, and so easily felt by the way that he communicates them, there is a quality of... Um, yeah, you know, his humanity is not, while well, it is unique, uh, the experiences that he writes about, the fears that he writes about, uh, the longings, the, 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 the desire to be loved and the fear that there's something grotesque in you and that you'll never be loved uh, is something so many of us uh, feel, you know, the, those of us who uh, may be socially awkward at times or um, you know, have something that keeps us from blending in, uh, or at least we feel like we've got something that prevents us from blending in. I think so many people connect with that. Uh, so I think writing from lived experience 
uh, he somehow is able to, to, to create something that is universal. It's not an act of narcissism. Like my life is so interesting, I must write about it. I've had these experiences and I need to share these experiences. When other people see themselves in his stories, uh, it becomes something much bigger than Ray Bradbury's. Uh, right, it's, it, it's not Instagram self-realization. He, I don't think he would do well on Instagram because Ray was all about metaphors. It's, right. um, it's something different. It's not saying, um, I, to be an authentic person, I must tell you who I am. It seems to me that Ray Bradbury was saying, to be an authentic person, I must tell me who I am. I must show myself who I am because he used over and over and over again in these uh, in his talks with students this metaphor of your job whatever you do is to say to the world this is who you are this is how i see you this is how i write you this is how i paint you this is who you are and then the world looks at what you've done and the world says aha that's who we are mm. so i wonder if in his fiction that's what he was continually doing and saying aha that's what that pain was about that's why Absolutely. i cried when i was 10 or 11 or whatever that's I guess that's why I spoke so deeply to me as a boy. I didn't even know why. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, Bill. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, I, I got to highlight a, a, a passage in Homecoming that, that I think kind of gets at the heart of the story. And, and maybe we can discuss it if, if it sparks ideas. Uh, Timothy, Uncle Einer's wings spread and twitched and came in with a sound like kettle drums. Sorry, I've got a... Um, the, the light's low in here, the, the text is faded. Timothy felt himself plucked up like a thimble and set upon Einer's shoulder. Don't feel badly. Nephew Timothy, each to his own, each in his own way. How much better things are for you. How rich. The world is dead for us. We've seen so much of it. Believe me, life's best to those who live the least of it it's worth more per ounce timothy remember that what's that sentence right before it's worth more per ounce what is that again life the world's death to us we've seen so much of it believe me life's best to those who live the least of it wow life's best for those who live the least of it hmm. because it's uh because it's more precious yes well that kind of flips on its head all of our ideas of uh, the point of life being to live long uh well <laughs> i think because it's precious we want to prolong it um uh but it, you know it, it, keep in mind he's 26 here but his quest he's on his quest to live forever at this point oh he knows he knows what his destiny is how do you live forever uh it's not by indefinitely staying in this wheelchair um and and continuing to, to let your body fall apart and trying to sustain uh whatever quality of life you get when you're at that stage uh you know it's about being remembered it, it's about uh, putting something out there for the world that can be taken down and read and appreciated um, for, for generations to come. And he did. You know, he became immortal. Um, I guess I should provide some context or they're going to think I'm talking nonsense here. But, um, you yeah, know, when Bradbury was 10, his silent film idol, Lon Chaney, died and he realized, oh my gosh, uh, if, if somebody like Lon Chaney can die, I can't escape that. It's going to come for me. And uh, so from a very young age, he had this foreboding sense of his own mortality. But a few years later, uh, he realized on a berry picking expedition with his dad and his brother that uh, that he was alive. You know, he looked at the goosebumps on his arms. And if you read Dandelion Wine, the opening passage of that, that's Ray putting that experience into fiction. So and, does uh, Uncle Einar, does Uncle Einar believe what he's saying to Timothy? Is, is he saying it to make Timothy feel better? Oh, is it true? Is, is it true for Uncle Einar? And oh, I wish that I had had an Uncle Einar, by the way. <laughs> right, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, no, I think that Uncle Einar does believe it. Um, I, I think he's he's given him uh, the silver lining to his uh, to his great defect that he's he's not magical, he's not immortal, um, that he's that he's entirely human, and that this means that uh, that, that you know your your time is going to expire one way or the other. But here's the best part of it. You're not going to get bored with life. 
because you don't have time to get bored with it. Um, wow, what an indictment on those of us who are bored with life. Right? <laughs> what Uncle Einar is saying is in as little time as we have, I could just hear Ray speaking from the cosmos. My God, how could you be bored? Right. <laughs> and yet we are sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think part of it's our addiction to convenience. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we could satisfy just about anything. If you want a dopamine hit, uh, hop on YouTube and watch the, the news channels that speak to you. Watch the comedians and the late night TV show host uh, that, that pander to um, what you already think and already believe. Uh, it's not fun to be challenged. Uh, it's not fun to have to, to reconsider things. Um, you know, and uh, in this consumerist culture, our, our fast food mentality, you know, you pull up to the window and say, number one with a diet, rather than having to, to go home and prepare the meat and the ingredients and, and make your own food. Uh, I, I, but, yeah. I, I wonder if sometime too, in our, in our dopamine seeking and our, we never come at it sideways, do we? I mean, we're always wanting the direct. I want to experience what I know I already like. So give that thing to me without deviation. Yes. Whereas uh, Ray always came with a metaphor. He could not, he said that he could not believe anything, imagine anything or understand anything without first finding the metaphor for it. Mm -hmm. It's your Life Magazine sent him down to Florida to write about the space program. It was supposed to be a big cover story and he got close to deadline and he said, I can't do it, hire somebody else. I can't do this. It's too much, it's too big, it's too much information. And they said, keep trying. And he said he was just about to cry, predictably, <laughs> because he couldn't figure out how to write this. And then a metaphor came to him and he found a metaphor to frame it. He found the frame and, there, and then he could write about the thing. But he never really wrote about the space program in that article. What he writes about is the metaphor, which allows you to imagine what the space program is, even though the space program didn't know that it was that thing. Now you know that it is because you have the metaphor. That's, was this, that's a really, uh, it's, it's a really indirect way of seeking understanding and pleasure. It takes some work. Yeah. Are, are we talking about an impatient Gulliver above our roofs or, or a title, something like that? Is that the story where? Uh, the, yeah, and the, the, well, the, then the one I was thinking of, there may be more metaphors than one in that article, but the one I'm thinking about is uh, he looked at all of the tests that NASA was doing and he said, all right, it's as if it's 1492 and Columbus goes uh, to the queen and says, build me give me money. And, he, and uh, she says, oh, you want to sail to the new world? No, I want to build an artificial ocean and 21 ships. And uh, <laughs> then he goes to, got to uh, uh, Da Vinci. Uh, uh, um, and he says, build me uh, robotic monsters that will come up out of the sea and, and scare my men and, and grab them and prepare them for what might be out there. So then he goes through all, he puts the ships on the sea and the robotic monsters come and some of the men die, some of the ships, but a few of them don't. And then two years later, he goes back to, to uh, the queen and he says, now I'm ready. Now give me money and now I will actually sail to the new world. He said, that's what we're doing down in Florida. And that's the way that he could understand what the space program was. He said, it's a stage. And what we're doing is imagining what it might be like out there. And, and, and then later in life, he said very critically to NASA, you've stopped doing theater and you, you will fail and you will lose the public support. You must do theater. That's what you are to people. You are a stage on which we imagine humanity continuing. Uh, so he was really adamant about the metaphors. Anyway, so I, I didn't mean to go yeah. afield, but I was just thinking about our, our seeking of, of, um, of pleasure so directly by that YouTube video that's about what I like rather than finding what the thing I like is like and, and liking it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good stuff. And don't ever apologize for going afield. Um, we're, we're, these these podcast style lectures are full of digressions, and I think sometimes that's where we get our our best stuff. Um, Bill, what what were your what's your take on the emissary? Uh, that's another story Bradbury wrote when he was very young. Loved that story since I was so young. I I, I read it again and again and again because I'm a dog lover. So I, I my identification was with the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and with uh, Martin's relationship with the dog, it never frightened me. It always comforted me in some weird way. I wasn't frightened by the ending. Um, I guess I was a rather dark child. <laughs> There's a passage in it. May I? Just of very course. briefly, there's one paragraph. Nobody reads Ray Brad better, better than Bill Oberst. No, let's see here. Um, I've got to do what you did with the light. 
It's his teacher, Mrs. Hayde, who comes to see him. On Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they talked and never stopped talking. And they spent the evening laughing. And she was handsome. And her hair was such a soft, stunning. It was like the season outside the window. And she walked clear, clean, and quick. A heartbeat warm in the afternoon. And when he heard it, he smiled. And above all, she had the sense, the secret of signs, and she could read and interpret dog and the symbols that she searched out and picked forth from his coat with her miraculous fingers, eyes shut, softly laughing in a gypsy's voice. She divined the world from the treasures in her hands. And on Monday afternoon, Miss Haight was dead. That struck me as a kid because she was so wonderful. She was beautiful. She was, she's almost mystical in that passage. She's such an integral part of Timothy's worldview. And on Monday, she was dead. Yeah, it's so abrupt. There, so there's Ray and that, that's death. I didn't like that sentence as a kid. Mm -hmm. And boy, I appreciate it now as an adult because Martin wants there to be more. But even at this young age, when Ray wrote this, he understood that that's it, door shut. Maybe something yeah. else, may not be something else. You'll never know. Boom, done. What did he say that uh, he said death is a hole in the back of your mouth where a tooth used to be. It's just an absence, but you can't help running your tooth back there and feeling for it over and over again mm -hmm. where the tooth once was. And, and it really struck me. So that's why at the end, when it's implied that dog has brought home <laughs> this visitor, I was, I was happy kind of that in some way she was back. And I didn't realize until years later that Martin probably was supposed to have been terrified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm with you. It, no, it's got a, it, it, you know, I wonder uh, what impact this may have had on Tim Burton as he was uh, creating Corpse Bride, you know? Um, it's, um, and I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't think it's, it's scary. Uh, she's always been a benevolent character to him. Why would she? Uh, why would she be anything else uh, if the dog went and got her? And, and the dog, you know, it, I think the supernatural in the story is the dog. We have a supernatural canine here. Yes. Um, what What makes this uh, supernatural is the connection that the boy and the dog have. Right, uh, because Bradbury implies that it's not just him picking things up and looking at them that he's experiencing in some way through the dog going out into the world. Well, yes. How do the dogs, uh, you know, process information primarily? It's through their sense of smell. Um, and, uh, you know, there you see those cartoons of a dog coming over and smelling uh, its person when, when, when the person gets home and is thinking about all of the places that the person went that was not, uh, that, that he didn't get to go with. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of a reverse here. You know, it's, it's like the dog is bringing the sense to the boy and he is encountering what's going on outside of the, the four walls of his bedroom as he's laid up and ill. He's getting to, to experience some of the world. You, you've got that in reverse here. And there's a whole series of stories that Ray wrote throughout his life about people being trapped um, in bed, uh, being sick. Um, there's something to dandelion wine. Uh, there's a CC in the homecoming who's trapped in yes. bed and can only experience. And then in the April Witch later, he writes about her again. Um, he writes about sickness, illness being trapped and having to experience the world through someone else he writes about that quite often yeah and, and i think that there's clearly a biographical element there because when he was about eight years old i don't know if it was rheumatic fever but i mean he was seriously ill i mean he missed months and months of school and was pretty much confined to his bed and aunt neva came and read to him uh, his aunt neva was about 10 years older and uh, they were very very close their entire life she was probably Ray's favorite uh, relative. And uh, while he loved all of his family, he really adored Neva. Uh, she's the one that got him interested in fairy tales. Uh, she's the one that helped develop his early literacy development by reading to him and then encouraging him to read. And uh, so when I read the, the, the interaction with the teacher coming to visit him when he's sick um, and it being so fine and beautiful, that's what Neva did for him when he was ill as a young person. So maybe, um, maybe in some way she was for him, bringing to him the outside world, things he had never experienced right, and could never know. Yeah. I, wonder if, I wonder if Ray would want us from that story to take away the fact that we need others to help us uh, interpret the world, um, 
would Martin have been better off if he just could have gone off and experienced all of this by himself? Or did he learn more about the world than he would have on his own because he was, was he, because he, he couldn't go out and experience it? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting thought. Really interesting. Race supernatural fiction is strange, isn't it? Because it's never intended to scare you. It doesn't seem it's never he never intends like to yeah to, he doesn't like matheson often really wants you to be absolutely creeped out but bradbury doesn't seem to he he always ends the story right before that point and what does this one end with martin head company mm -hmm. and yep. there it is yeah yeah um yeah i, I think i i don't know how, how would we we classify this is it light horror you know, is that horror at all, or is it best to just label it supernatural fiction? I think I think you've hit it just right. I don't believe that it is horror, mm -hmm. um, because yeah, it, he 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 wasn't right. He only wrote one horror story in his life, and that was the October Game. And, yeah. Um, and folks, if you haven't read the October Game, it's really short, and yeah, you should read that thing. And I, I call I, it I that, can, that that I thing. can throw a copy in the chat here if you guys are interested. Awesome. You know, because, Bradbury. Uh, what, once Bradbury had children, he said uh, he, he didn't want that story included in collections, and he said he never would have written it. Yep, yep. He, he was very reluctant to have that published anywhere. I, somebody convinced him. I don't. I think it's in Long After Midnight is, is where it appears, which is another fantastic collection. It's, I think it's highly underrated because of how progressive it is. I, I'm pretty sure that that's where, uh, well, I know that uh, I've talked with, um, uh, with a member of the transgender community. Um, uh about oh, 10 or 15 years older than me uh and he says that uh when he was young reading the story the title story of that collection long after midnight was the first time that he felt seen by an author and uh, mm -hmm. uh powerful collection but you can find the october game in that as well but i can i can put a pdf in the chat for you i so I, I think it's it's dark think, and think, gruesome yeah i think of race fiction is magical uh in some ways so when he's practicing dark magic in the homecoming and the side and the emissary and then later on he's practicing sort of a white magic but to me he, he's always a magician mm -hmm. um and at one point in his life he, he said that's how i would like to be remembered as your favorite magician yeah that was something he was fascinated with his entire life we've got his magic kit from when he was uh, a little boy um here in the center and uh, I, I and i think he accomplished that i think he pulled it off i, I really do um so you know it's it's interesting that we're having this conversation because i've always put the october country stories the weird tales in kind of the horror genre i've said you know ray bradbury is known primarily for three genres science fiction fantasy and horror um and, and you know of course he wrote some detective fiction as well and some just surrealist kind of nostalgic midwestern fiction that you get in, in dandelion wine uh, but, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, you know, you had Anthony Boucher and you had Damon Knight critiquing Bradbury's work and acknowledging his profound influence on the science fiction genre, but also saying his science fiction doesn't really qualify as science fiction because he's not telling you anything about the technology. You know, he's not telling you anything about the scientific understanding that was never. He didn't, he didn't care. Didn't care at all. It was, it was always focused on the human element. You know, what are we going to do when we expect more from our devices and less from each other? You know, that's uh, that's the big what if what, what if question that appears in so much of a science fiction. Um, now, you, yeah, a digression, please, which I have to ask. It's been on my mind in the homecoming. Uh, he plays with this weird family aesthetic that Charles Adams was also playing with uh, television shows like the Munsters. It was very prevalent in the culture. There are a lot of variations of the the weird family. Was there something going on in American culture at that time that was causing that idea to bubble up so often in so many different forms? I don't know. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, you've got Charles Adams uh, coming out with a cartoon that was, uh, well, you know, this is before Leave it to Beaver, but still the family sitcom was was very much in vogue. You have I Love Lucy and, uh, and shows like that. And I, I think that they are having fun kind of turning these, these things on their head, you know, uh, this, this rosy, image of the family and you've got another family that's coming in and the things that they value are the opposite of what the standard um nuclear family is supposed to value you know uh, having dinner together um, 
uh, you know, br bringing the wife flowers, honey, I'm home sort of things, uh, and, and kind of inverting the things that, that they value and uh, relishing what we would find the gross and the terrible. Uh, I think I think Adams was was probably the first to do that in a comical way. Uh, Ray's is much more emotional, I think. We, we really uh, fall in love with Timothy and uh, feel bad for him. Why can't Timothy be a werewolf or something? You know, yeah. I didn't see that longing. He wants. And he that, wants so yeah. badly to be, and he even tries when he comes downstairs. Uh, you know, when CC's mm -hmm. playing the trick on him, he yeah. he, he thinks he's really he, he really wants to be accepted. He wants to just. What did he say? He said, "I want to do something that'll make them love me." That's so mm -hmm. heart wrenching. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, CC complies, and then reveals the trick to everybody so everybody makes fun of him and, and totally humiliates him. How, and and how, why does she do it? Because she also wants to be loved because she says, come up and see me. Yes, yes. She's also isolated. She uses him as a vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bill, uh, we've had so many conversations about monsters. Well, just, just wrapping up the thought about Bradbury, not, you know, the idea is he brought science fiction into the literary mainstream without having ever written what some would label true science fiction. What they mean by true science fiction is they mean hard science fiction that is typically at that time written by scientists, you know, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Isaac Asimov, uh, people like that. They were scientists who wrote fiction. Bradbury was a literary guy who wrote science fiction. And, uh, but he was probably the one that was most influential and getting science fiction out of this kind of weird niche pulp that nerdy uh, boys read and into something that, that, that a far broader audience could appreciate. Uh, and he, he takes the Gothic tradition and he sets it in, uh, he takes it out of the Victorian mansions and the, the places of elite you see with Lovecraft. You know, so many of Lovecraft's stories, there is a wealthy person who's trying to tap into the occult sort of thing. Bradbury brings it into the everyday into the place that's very common, uh, into the rural areas, into the suburbs. And um, and it, it, this is interesting. I'm, I'm reluctant to take this out of the horror genre classification, but I'm perfectly okay calling it Ray's supernatural fiction. Yes. Uh, the only reason I'm reluctant is because of the profound impact he had on the most famous horror writers that are, are working today. You know, the Clive Barkers, um, Peter Straub, who recently passed, I hated to hear that. Um, and uh, of course, Stephen King, who says there would be no Stephen King if there was no Ray Bradbury. Um, yes. It's it, it's interesting that you know we're talking about two different genres and his influence on those genres, and yet you can make the claim he never really wrote significantly in either one of those genres because uh, his his approach to that type of genre writing is so unique. And Ray's voice was uh, stubbornly unique, no matter what genre he was writing in. He, yeah. he's, his detective fiction is not really genre fiction. It's a, whatever genre he's writing in, if you have read Bradbury before, something starts to call, you smell something, and you're, this is, this is Ray. Yeah. This is Bradbury. Yeah. He, he, I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is. Dickens has the same feel for me that you can just pick up a passage and you can smell Dickens. Right. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bill, uh, oh, we're getting small on time here. But uh, before we go, I want to talk about the making of a monster. Mm. Uh, Ray's sympathies always lie with the monster, the hunchback of Notre Dame, the, the phantom. Your sympathies, more often than not, lie with the monster, and mine as well. Yes. Uh, we, we, we Because... Um, if somebody just drops a monster in our lap and is killing people and doing horrible things, I think instinctively, and correct me if I'm wrong, I could be projecting here and I don't want to do that. Uh, the first thing that you and I want to know is why is the monster doing this? You know, what, what is the motivation? What put this uh, entity in, in this place and, and in this state? Um, I think, uh, and I think that's, that's true for Bradbury as well. He always uh advocated for the misfit he always advocates uh and gives you some some semblance of sympathy for the monster I, well maybe not always i don't think we necessarily see that the man upstairs but in the scythe we see uh, the creation of a monster in this That's story right. and right. 
uh, just just want to get your, your thoughts on that. You, you just expressed my thoughts. I thought about that with Drew, who's now hardly even Drew anymore, at the end is just swinging wildly that the green and the right, and he's become, um, oh, and you would know because you just did the Halloween tree, the um, uh, figure in mythology who swings down on humanity. Sauron, perhaps? Sauron, yeah. The, if the I'm Celtic, remembering correctly. Yeah, the he, Celtic God of Death, yeah. He's become that, and all Drew really wanted to begin with was a place for his family to be able to eat and to rest. And uh, this is what the world, fate, God, creation, uh, whatever, this is what it gave him instead. And he has to become it. It's, a, it's tragic and um, horrifying. And at the oh, same time, yeah. it, it's such a beautiful metaphor to think, Ray is again making us say, oh, that's who we are. Oh, that's who we are. Because bombs fell on Tokyo and London all of the wars, all the things, think of all the horrible things. My God, these the horrible things that happen in our world, why do they happen? Perhaps because someone is wounded or because a lot of us are wounded. It's, it's a mind blowing concept. How yeah. the hell did he ever think of that? I don't know, but I, it's, it's, it's unlike any story I've read. I, I can't compare it to anything. And, and uh, knowing full well that my, uh, there, I still have plenty of stuff to read, and I may stumble across something that would suggest that Ray got the idea from someone else. But from what I can tell right now, my vantage point and uh, everything that I've read and, and looked at, uh, th this is a, a very unique story. Um, perhaps you know, perhaps there's some Greek mythology that's that's coming in here. Um, who was the um, which god was it that that took a lover, a human lover who was mortal? And she loved him, may have been Aphrodite. She went to Zeus and said, uh, can you give him everlasting life? And Zeus grants him everlasting life, but does not grant him everlasting youth. And basically he's sentenced to continue to decay and get older and more decrepit. And uh, it, it, to the point where he can't function or do anything, but he's not, he, he gets no relief because he's immortal. Yes. Um, you know, the, the idea that you, you've got a tremendous gift, you know, and, and the, the Great Depression is obviously uh playing a role in motivating the story this is an oppression era story where the family is nomadic they're traveling they're looking for work again another autobiographical element of ray bradbury the reason he ended up in los angeles in his teenage years is because during the great depression his father lost his job as a lineman couldn't find a spot anywhere in the country um, until he went to los angeles the family had enough money to survive for 30 days in los angeles and, and, and that, uh, yeah uh, that wheat field is set in California, just off of a busy highway. It says you know, maybe I maybe interstate or highways. I'm remembering, but it's it's you know people whizzing by, having no idea that the field of mortality is just out of their sight. That's very um, it's very epic, isn't it? It's very, and I guess it's as good an explanation as any for mom. Why do people die? Well, honey, it's because a guy in a wheat field has to keep swinging a sigh, and one day it's going to be your wheat that's cut. Oh, okay, yeah. thanks, mom. <laughs> it's as good as explanation as any. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. I, I, I mean, it, uh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, the folks in the class know I missed a week—not um, last week, but the week before. So I was dealing with family tragedy. My um, my niece passed away, uh, and um uh, yeah, yeah there there are certain things that just seem utterly senseless and uh and unfair and uh, you're absolutely right this is as good an explanation as any you know because there's there is no making sense of why things happen at certain times and for what reason or purpose i'm sorry for your loss oh thanks thanks that's, yeah. that's hard um one of the things that being a voracious reader so young did for me was to, to make me understand that to live as a human is to suffer largely yeah and that our joys um our delights exist in opposition to the suffering which is at the core of life and, and maybe that's why i connected with bradbury because bradbury writes a great deal about suffering and death and um yearnings that will never be fulfilled and but to him, all of this is essential to being human. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and the other thing is, you know, uh, 
life's life's a pretty rare gift. You know, even though there's there's so much uh, pain that we encounter through the course of our lives. Yes. We haven't found life on any other speck of dust in the cosmos except for the one that's right here. This this what Carl Sagan called this pale blue dot, this moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Um, and uh, and I think it's mathematically plausible that there is life out there in the cosmos that we're not going to be able to reach in our lifetime and maybe we'll, we'll never connect with. So it's rare, you know, and going back to what Uncle Leiner communicates to Timothy, it's that rarity and uh, the, the, the finite quality of it, the, the limited quality of it that makes it precious. We, 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 you know, to, to be alive, to have consciousness, to be able to think, to be able to read great literature, to be able to look at art, uh, to be able to have a shared cultural heritage and, and connect with other human beings. That's rare. This doesn't happen very often in the cosmos. And uh, uh, so what's the meaning of life? I, I, I don't know that I've got a definitive answer, but my gut says it's to live, to live to the fullest, to enjoy life, to enjoy each other, to, to make everybody, to, to ease the suffering of other people whenever you can. And uh, yes. yeah, Bradbury, even his dark stories are a ball for me. Um, I, I hope that I, I hope that um, those who maybe through this class have been exposed to Bradbury but haven't been before, that they'll continue along the journey because you just maybe think of uh, the story of the dwarf. Yes. There's so yeah. much, um, so much yearning in that and so much of humanity and what we are, but what we don't have to be, but what we sometimes choose to be. Uh, yeah, I, I hope folks will continue exploring Ray. And you know how Ray said, I don't think he would mind us reading him the way he said to explore a library. He said, um, walk in, pull a book off a shelf, open it up and see if you fall in love. And if you don't fall in love, say to hell with you and throw it down and pick another book. He said, "That's." <laughs> he said, never start at the beginning, always start in the middle and see if you're in love. So I don't think he would mind us picking up a collection of Bradbury stories and flipping it open. If you, if, if you do that though enough, I bet you'll fall in love. Oh, I agree. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's the one drawback to, to these types of settings. Y'all are obligated to read what I assign. And, and that sense of obligation automatically uh, puts up a barrier to falling in love sometimes. I, I don't I experienced it as a student. And I, I still experience it if I feel like I'm obligated to read something. Um, but uh, Bradbury, uh, he's he's worth reading and rereading and um, and exploring and, and, and the dwarf is a great example of of what we're talking about uh so much here the the idea of being the other of being excluded that fear of there's something in me that's grotesque ray's working that fear that he has that deep-seated fear that he has that i have that i'm sure bill has i'm sure many people in this class have that uh if we if we expose this one part of ourselves nobody's going to love us we've got to keep this in um and uh, I, I think the dwarf is a, a fantastic story for that. A, another October country story. But, and, and Ray says that the part of you that you most fear to show to the world because you won't be accepted, that that is the reason that you are on this planet, that that is your purpose in life. The thing of which you are, are most afraid that you will not, he says, the reason you feel so strongly about that is because that is a part of your vocation, which I find really challenging. Yeah, agreed. Bill, is your Lon Chaney Award handy? Would you show that to us? I don't have it near me. Have I have Lon, oh. That's Lon behind me. Right, yeah. That's a, a, a photo of Lon. The Chaney Award that he's mentioned was given by the Chaney family for outstanding achievement in horror cinema. In the first year they gave it to me and Ron's, yeah. Lon's great, great grandson, Ron, gave it to me and I cried, which Ray oh. would have appreciated. I truly <laughs> wept. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I love it. I, I think that that is, that is so cool. Um, uh, I, I, anyway, I just, well, I, that was one other thing, like, uh, that I, I don't know, I felt like I had to throw in at the end there because I want people to realize what a big deal it is to have you oh, here with God. us talking about Bradbury. Yes, yes. And the thing is, you know, as, um, you know, as Bradbury can write things that are spooky and, uh, and I think a lot of his scariest stories are his science fiction stories. You know, you take the city, for example, or zero hour, um, very, very chilling. Um, he was, he was very optimistic. 
and he was so generous with his time. Yes. And Bill, so are you. And I, uh, I, I can't tell you how much appreciation I've got for you. Well, so and, are you. And, uh, uh, and so is everybody who volunteers with that Bradbury Center. Um, I just, you don't know how much it means to those of us who love Ray's work that you are preserving it and expanding it and reinterpreting it and keeping it alive, not something you know, to lie in a coffin covered with dust or on a pedestal, but you're ripping it apart and, and showing new pieces of it in new light to the world. Ray would love that. He would never want to be dead. And he's so not. Thank you. Oh, well, I, we could just uh, exchange compliments, but Bill, you are, you're, you're, you're a big deal. And thank you. This, this, uh, I owe you one and uh, let me know when I can return the favor. Actually, I owe you three or four at this point. Let me know when I can return favors. You've right. done it many, many times over, my friend. Thank you for this. Yeah. No, no and worries. thank you guys for, um, thank you for listening to a, a non-expert ramble. It was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I think uh, I, I think you qualify. You've read Ray deeply, and you, you're keeping his words alive uh, through through your stage plays, and um, it, it, and yeah, it's it's just uh, wonderful. And so, everybody, uh, just uh, just a quick uh, housekeeping thing. Um, next week, you don't have to read anything for this class unless you've fallen behind and want to catch up. Um, uh, because of the way fall break fell. We didn't really have a fall break, but we are taking Thanksgiving week off. When you get back, uh, we are pumping the brakes. Uh, there's not going to be, I, I don't think, any heavy workloads. So if you get started on your final papers and your final projects and start chipping away at those now, uh, I think we've got a pretty smooth path to the end of the semester. So as long as you don't procrastinate, start chipping away at what's to come, you're, you're going to be in really, really good shape for the end of the semester. Plus, your papers are going to be better if you start now and just whittle away at them little by little um, every day or every other day. Um, so uh, there's that. Uh, enjoy the week off or enjoy the week of reprieve so that you can get caught up on certain things. Bill, thanks again, man. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Thank you. You too, man. Bye.